Now let's prepare our hearts as we step into the book of 3 John and hear about truth, love, and obedience. Okay, if you would, grab your Bibles and open up to the book of 3 John, which is in the New Testament. We're in a four-part series, and this is the fourth part of a series through these two books, 2 and 3 John. And these books really kind of explain and stand upon the foundations of truth, love, and obedience. Truth, love, and obedience. Today we'll look at 3 John, verses 9 through 15. But the backdrop and the context and really the intent of the content that is known as 2 and 3 John are really a fuller explanation of truth, love, and obedience. Truth is absolute and knowable. Truth is that which corresponds coherently to reality. Love is action and emotion. Love is the alignment of IQ and EQ. Love impacts head, heart, and hands. Obedience is a lifestyle. A lifestyle is made up of attitudes, actions, beliefs, and choices. A, B, C. Aligned with IQ and EQ. Obedience grows, matures, develops, and reproduces. And you might say, that is a lot to process in the introduction. What in the world is this sermon going to be like? Here's what I would say to that. Yeah, Samuel's like, amen to that man. What in the world? You know why that's so fire hydrant? Because you live in the 21st century culture of an American society that believes they have the right to define truth, love, and obedience. And so when you hear someone say truth is absolute, knowable, and must coherently correspond to reality, you say, those are fighting words. Truth is relative to what I want it to be. Truth is not true for all people, all places, and all times. Well, wake up, and let me, let me say something to you. The Pensacola Bridge is out. Say, what do you mean by that? That's true, knowable, absolute, and it corresponds coherently to reality. Say, well, how do I know that? Okay, well, if you don't believe me, Let's walk down or ride down, or we can actually dance down Highway 98 and Gulf Breeze proper because there's nobody there. And I, I can show you the bridge. I can show you that the truth of the statement that I just declared aligns with reality, coherently and correspondently. And it's absolute. You know what? It's not open for Jerry and not open for Neil. It's not open for either of us. It's knowable. You can go there and know it. You say, how? Just keep walking. You're going to fall. Like, that's how. (laughs) It's knowable. The the bridge isn't there. Listen, nobody cares about a bridge till it's gone, man. (laughs) Right? Did you ever care about it? Nobody cares about a bridge till she no longer works. There's a lot to that statement. But I can't unpack that right now. In 3 John, story is most helpful. Illustration and example and lifestyle is most helpful. So listen, let me have your attention, let me see your eyes. John gives three examples, Gaius, Diotrephus, and Demetrius, of examples of both positive and negative, of someone who lives a lifestyle of truth, love, and obedience. Last week, if you were with us, you may remember Gaius or Gaius, depending on your preference. (sighs) Man, this guy, we'll just call him G. 
G was an example of health. G was healthy in spirit. G was, was healthy in status. G had the right perspective on stuff and a healthy perspective on life and eternity. That was G. He's the good. And then there was the bad. Who's the bad? Diotrephus. If Gaius, G, was the dreamer, Diotrephus is the drainer. He's the one to avoid, not the one to adore. He's the one to forget, not the one to follow. Diotrephus, who is he? We're going to read about him in just a moment. He was command and control in his leadership style. He did not govern people. He dictated them. He was a liar, selfish, and abusive verbally, and emotionally, and financially, and religiously. That's Diotrephus. He's bad. That's one to avoid. That's one to forget. Because he drains from you. And then there's Demetrius. Demetrius is the not so ugly. Did you get the play on words? The good, the bad, and the not so ugly? No, nobody cares about the dude that shot guns and said, I'll be, oh, whatever. Okay, I, don't, I forget his name. He's a famous guy. Clint Eastwood, that's his name. Just remember that because of Marty McFly. I was thinking, Marty McFly, who did he try to be? Oh, yeah, Clint. Okay, never mind. Too much. Demetrius is the not so ugly. He's the one to follow. He has a lifestyle of faith and faithfulness and friendship. I would like to ask you to do something that we don't do every single Sunday when the Word of God is read, but we are going to do it this Sunday. I'd like to read the entire text that we're considering, 3 John verses 9 through 15, from the New Living Translation. But out of respect for who wrote this book and the many lives that have been given so that you can understand it in your language, I'm going to ask you to stand as I read 3 John 9 through 15. So if you would stand, and here's what we're doing today. We're going to read it, pray, observe, interpret, and apply it, and then hopefully you'll live it. 3 John 9, if you're there, please let me know by saying, Jesus is Lord. Here's what John writes. You're picking it up half thought, because we did the last half last time. I wrote to the church about this. About what? Well, check out last week's sermon. But Diotrephus, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come... I'll report some of the things he's doing and the evil accusations he's making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, but he also tells others not to help them. And when they do help, you know what he does? He puts them out of the church. Dear friend, don't let this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good Prove that they're God's children. And those who do evil prove that they do not know God. Everyone speaks highly of Demetrius, as does the truth itself. See, there's truth aligned with reality that corresponds and is coherent. That's where it comes from. We ourselves can say the same for him. See, it's knowable. We can know it too. And you know we speak the truth. That's absolute. The Bible, man, can't beat it. I have much more to say to you, but I don't want to write it with pen and ink, for I hope to see you soon, and then we will talk face to face. Peace be with you. Your friends here send you their greetings. Please give my personal greetings to each of our friends there. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit, which inspired your Holy Word, would now give illumination and application to your holy people. 
And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I have not been honest with you. you say, what do you mean? I said there's three examples. There are. But there's actually one more tucked between the lines. You say, what do you mean by that? Verses 9 through 11, we see Diotrephus, the bad. Verse 12, we see Demetrius, the not so ugly. But did you pick up that in verses 13 through 15, there's actually the heart of a dad being expressed? We will consider these three today. Diotrephus, the bad. Demetrius, the the not so ugly. And then the dad's heart. Verses 9 through 11, they, they speak of Diotrephus. Now, what does John have to say about Dio? Well, not good stuff. He says, listen, I've told you this before. He's a bad example. Don't let him influence you. Don't be dumb, he's saying. Follow what's good. For remember, the lifestyle is the proof of who someone is. Those who practice evil. How do you practice evil? Well, let me just share a few ways. Head. You could stop right there. What do you mean? Did you know that there are those out there and sometimes in here that hands and heart appear to love good and to stay away from evil, but in their mind, their head is given over to all kinds of imaginative and evil thoughts. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. People always show you what they want you to see. Always. Please do not be naive enough to think because someone has earned a title or a role or has resource or reputation that they are who you think they are. Allow there to be time and relationship to discern the asset, if I can use that word, to discern who a person is. It takes time. I love Cecilia Jane Spencer. I think she's a sweet girl. She's the only one that's wearing a hat, so you can pick her out in a crowd. She didn't like that, sorry. Um, But here's what I was told by my mentor. Don't marry her until you date her for a year. I said, why? She seems like a pretty good girl. I know some people that get married, like, like Chuck Smith got married in six weeks, bro. Like, hey, Chuck did it. I can do it. Like, here's his opinion. I'm not going to tell you who this guy is, but this is his opinion. People change. Seasons actually have an impact on a person's mental health. Holidays. At least 12 months before you pop that question. I thought, well, you know, it's not bad advice. And I'm not very good at anything. But one thing I'm good at, I will say this. I'm not going to stop. Only thing I want to be good at is endurance, because that's what wins the day. It's not talent. It's not treasure. It's not how smart you are. It's can you outlast the guy behind you, or in front of you, or beside you? What is your endurance level for pain, for suffering, for time, to allow a thought to be fully maturated? I thought, well, if it's only 12 months till I get to marry her, I can wait 12 months. She's worth it. I'll wait. A lot of people don't wait. You ever read that, heard that song, Good Things Come to Those Who? I think there's a lot of truth to that, man. But here's the deal. Diotrephus was evil, but people thought he was good because he had religious position. And here's John calling him out. That guy's evil. Wow. Can you imagine if I said that in a letter about like a local guy? Like, that guy's evil. Don't follow him. You'd be like, wow. That's a powerful thing to say. John, man, he didn't pull any punches. Well, how how is he a bad example? I like alliteration, so here you go. Status, selfish, slanderous, and slippery. See, what do you mean by that? Status. What does John say about him? He loves to be the leader. Do you know those people that are hungry for power and money? Don't follow those people. Avoid them. Those are drainers, not dreamers. He says, Diotrephus, he loves position. He loves status. 
There are some guys, I've met them, I've been through kind of a lot of different training experiences in my life. And this is what I would say. I have some friends. Maybe we should call them acquaintances. Not frenemies. I don't want to have frenemies if I don't have to, but that they have to be a pastor. What do you mean by that? That's what their identity is in. But I'm thankful that I learned from my dad this lesson. That when he started this church, he said this. Listen, Lynn. Lynn's my mom. If this isn't fruitful in a year, I'll go do something else. Like, I don't have to do this to be like, oh, I'm somebody. No, like, if God's not blessing and God's not leading and guiding, then I'll go sell vacuums or donuts. He did both of those things. Like, I like that in my dad. That shows true humility. Like, the best leader to follow, in my opinion, this is just the NIV, Neil's interesting version, is a reluctant leader. Okay, what do you mean by that? Someone who says, well, I'll serve... But here's what happens if you keep serving. You become what is known as a servant leader. Because I've got to be honest with you, I've been around church a long time. Try and outlast someone in service. You'll stand alone most of the time. Not a lot of people like to be treated like a servant. And one of my mentors once told me this, you're, Neil, you're not a servant yet. I said, why? What, what? I'm trying because when you get treated like one, you react. But you know you're a servant when someone doesn't give you any respect, any attention, any time of day. They treat you like a servant, and you go, that's cool. You know you're a servant when you get treated like one, and it doesn't impact you. I have a lot to do to grow in that scenario. But Diotrephus, he was all about status. You know what else he was? He was selfish. What do you mean? He didn't want to have anything to do with John and his friends. Now, let me ask you a question. I, I want to see your hand in response to this. Before you stepped into this room, had anyone ever heard of the disciple or the apostle John before? Like, oh, I've heard that name. Okay. Can I ask you this question? Is it as popular or like familiar as Diotrephus? Anyone ever heard of old Diotrephus? How many have you got kids named Diotrephus, right? Like, I mean, you ever heard of a guy named John? Oh, that's my dad. Like, I mean, like, that, okay, this is what I'm trying to say. Diotrephus was dumb. You say, what do you mean? John was there. John's one of the disciples. Not only is he one of the disciples, he's like one of the top three. Peter, James, and John. You ever read the Gospels? Not only is he that, this dude's tough. What do you mean? He wrote the book of Revelation on Patmos. What's Patmos? I've been there. Patmos is a rock in the middle of nowhere. And they dipped John in oil to try and kill him and threw him on that rock. And you know what happened to him? God gave him the book of Revelation. It's like, you're not going to stop that guy. And then this little, like, nobody, in my opinion, Diotrephus shows up on the scene. It's like, oh, don't, don't hang out with John. I'm the guy. You're like, what the heck? Like, <laughs> John is here. And if John shows up to church, I would listen to him. Yeah, hey, uh, that's like the apostle that Jesus loved. And Dio showed up on the scene, and we're supposed to listen to Dio? Who the heck is Dio? Where is he from? Who trained him? How long has he been around? Yet this is the nature of things. Status, selfish, slanderous. What's slander? Get on Facebook, you'll figure it out. Like, spreading evil accusations. This is slander. Do you know who is known as the accuser? No, oh, I don't want to say that. I was going to make an attorney joke, but I won't say that. Because, like, you know, there's that the attorney accuser. That's part of the process, right? Prosecution, accusation. Like, the accuser of the brethren is a guy known as Satan, Lucifer, the devil. Have you ever come to church and done this and go, I hate how this is done. I this and that and this and that. Three fingers are pointing back at you, bro, and you point that finger. What you don't like is what's reflected in you. Here's what happens to the truth. The truth is a mirror. When you look into a mirror and you go, man, I don't like that. Why? Because it's reflecting back to you where your heart is. When this is expressed and you go, man, that makes me upset. Why? The wisdom of God is peaceable. It should melt your heart, not harden it. The truth of God should bring conviction, not accusation about the messenger. 
or the message or the place in which the message is given, if that's your heart, here's what I would say. You have a problem with authority, and the ultimate authority is God. You have a problem with God. If you're one that's like, man, I always just buck the system. I always do my own thing. I'd go, "Uh uh-oh. Even the angels have authority structure. Authority is not your enemy. Authority is set up to be your friend. But authority can be abused. I understand that. But see, this guy, Diotrephus, he was status-driven, selfish-driven, slanderous, and he was slippery. People were confused. Like, they couldn't articulate it, but have you ever been around those guys in business or with money or with their morality? And you go, like, there's smoke there. Like, I don't know where the fire is, but it just, something's wrong. One of my mentors once said this about at least false teaching. I'll just apply it in that platform. He said, Neil, God's sheep may sometimes not be able to articulate what's wrong, but they sense it. They sense it. I will never forget some sheep sensing something in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And they said, Neil, our pastor is preaching polygamy. And I said, there's no way. 20th century, Northwest Florida, no way. You're just mad at him because he changed the carpet color or something. That was my assumption. Like, I didn't say that, but as a pastor's kid, you realize most time people throw accusations because they're salty about something. But like, like polygamy, I mean, come on, polygamy in the 20th century? It's like, all right, well, I'll check it out. I'll meet with him, met with that guy three times. Yeah, there is some like weirdness there. But polygamy, that's pretty gnarly. Google it. James Flanders, Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Google it, that's all I'll say. Sheep can sense when there's something wrong. It may not be able to articulate it or say, there it is. But in their heart of hearts, they go, okay, let me pray about this. It's not just me being angry or, I just, man, there's just something. And I, there's like, you Matthew 18 it. Like, I'm not just going to like create a blog about it. Like, I'm going to talk to the guy. I'm going to do it in a group if necessary. I'm going to take it to church leadership. Like, conflict is not our enemy. Hiding is. Conflict, when it's done Matthew 18 and Matthew 22 and all that done well, like that's, that's I, has anyone ever been married? Or I had, a, I had another human they've met. Like, conflict's a part of that. If you've ever met another human, it's like, oh, it, you know, it's, it's like biologically that way. Because if you were the same, then you would be the same. DNA, but you are different. Therefore, you shall have conflict. It is biologically a true statement. And it is true relationally. Conflict is not your enemy. Maybe we should learn how to do conflict well. Because conflict done well, it benefits people. You sharpen, you grow, you see blind spots. Like, oh, But when it's like aggro, that doesn't help anybody. But effective conflict does. Let me read to you again this guy's dash. Say dash, what does that mean? You'll you'll understand in a second. Look at verses 9 and 11. This is who Diotrephus ended up being. John writes, Diotrephus loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us, when I came, I'll report of some of the things he's done and even the evil accusations. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. And when they do, he puts them out of the church. Don't follow this bad example. Listen, basically, if I could put it in the NIV, you know someone's legit because of their lifestyle. And this guy's lifestyle is whack. Don't follow that guy. That's what John is saying about Diotrephus. This guy is the bad. He's the drainer. He's the one to avoid. He's the one to forget. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you should be friends with everyone. There's some people to go, no way, bro. Not letting you in my world. You're a drainer. You're an accuser. You're someone who seeks to dictate people's lives. You don't seek to help them govern their lives. You're not on my radar. Diotrephus. The bad. So what do we do? Well, here's what I think we do. First, we must recognize that there's bad people out there, and there's bad right here. You say, what do you mean? Did you know that the seeds of faithfulness and failure are within all of our hearts? 
But you can't read some blog or some news article about some guy and go, oh, I would never. Man, but for the grace of God, there go all of us. But don't be afraid of failure. Why? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And all you have to do to dispel darkness is turn on the light. You don't have to start chasing all the darkness. Oh, I've got this problem. I've got this problem. I... No, just, man, get to know God's word. Listen to me. Truth is more powerful than a lie. I was speaking with someone yesterday who's just so caught up in the political nature of our country. And they were like, man, I'm reading this, and I'm watching this, and I'm hearing this, and I'm reading that, and I'm doing this. And I said, when was the last time you read this? And they're like, well, I ain't got time. I got to follow this book. I, I have to know what's going on. And I got to, are you going to really, ch-? like, read this, bro. Read this. And trust God with this. Does not mean we just take the foot off the gas and don't give our all to everything that we feel God's called us to. Don't misunderstand me. But what I am saying is this. You don't study error to look for truth. You study truth and then you know error. That's how it works. You study God's word and then you can recognize, ah, that smells to me. How do I know? Because my senses are right. Be a person of the book. My mentor once told me this. Neil, here's who I want you to be. I was like, okay, what do you want me to be? Be a man who thinks outside the box, but never outside the book. But I can do that. But I got to get to know this book in order to do that. Or else I don't know if my outside the box is outside the book. See, stop trying to be creative. Stop trying to be cool. Stop trying to be an influencer. Stop trying to prove your point. Get to know the book and then think outside the box. But until you know the book, you may not know if you're outside it or not. Don't follow the bad example. John writes, so how do I not follow someone? This is how I think you do it. You remember the police? They wrote that song, Sending Out an SOS. Anyone remember that? Like, what? This was like left field. What are you talking about? Does anyone remember that song, Sending Out an SOS? Okay, okay. SOS, bro. Spiritual, organic, and strategic. You got a problem? Here's what I think. I think you need to take a step spiritually. Well, what's the problem? First, there's a problem that you can't solve. It's a spiritual problem that impacts the whole of your life. It's called sin, and you're headed to hell. Whoa, that's gnarly on a Sunday. Yeah, but it's true. So here's the deal. Apart from Jesus, you are kind of in that situation where your spiritual problem has not been solved. Faith must be in the literal, physical, risen Savior known as Jesus Christ. And when you place your faith in the perfect life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and I'm saying all those things for a reason, I think you come alive. Some of us just think it's just about the cross. Listen to me. If Jesus didn't live a perfect life, the cross means nothing. If Jesus didn't die on the cross, then your salvation means nothing. If he wasn't buried for three days and then risen again, you're still in your sins, 1 Corinthians. But also, if you don't, uh, if you don't remember the purpose of the ascension, no wonder you're powerless in your Christianity. You have forgotten that you are to be filled by the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, when I ascend, he descends. Christianity, nobody can live except one guy. His name's Christ. It's Christ in you. That's your hope of glory. See, when you know the full truth, then you're set free. What's the full truth? Jesus lived the perfect life, died the perfect death, was buried, rose again, and ascended into heaven. And now he's given you his spirit so that you can have full, abundant life by abiding in him. That's the good news. It's not he died and rose and just pray this prayer and you're out of hell, bro. What do I do with the rest of my life? I don't know. Like, no, there's an ascension where he gave his Holy Spirit to both author God's word and empower your heart to live an obedient, holy, fruitful life. Do you know that message? Are you living it? I can tell if you are. Say, how? Attitude, actions, beliefs, and choices. Shows me. Yes, this one is initiated. I mean, to borrow a phrase that was a hashtag a minute ago, this one's woke, right? Like, this one's alive. This one's awake. This one sees it because they know the full gospel. That it's about the life and death and burial and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And here's the other thing. 
and he's coming again. If he ascended, what, you ever heard that phrase? What goes up must come. He's coming back. I hope that motivates your, your, your monetary interests. You grow spiritually. You grow organically. You grow strategically. This is not Charlie Brown's parents for me. This is my life's work over the last 20 years to be able to define the who, what, where, when, why, how, is, is not question of what is a church and how do I be a part of it. And this stuff's great, like the story, like you didn't, I don't know if you know this, but you live in an area where the first Jesus worship service was ever held in America, the cross, 1559, Pensacola Beach, that was the place it happened. But how do I, how do I live it? S O S. Spiritually, organically, and strategically. And this stuff is free, man. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to have a lot of money. You just have to be obedient and faithful by the power of his spirit. That's what's so funny about it. He's the one that empowers you to do it. So it's like a win-win to follow Jesus. It's a win-win. Or here's what I would say. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes because we're, we're not going to belabor this point much longer. <sighs> Live it. Or don't, but stop playing around. Stop pretending. Choose life or choose death, but make a choice. And here's the deal. By doing nothing, you're choosing something. Indifference is a negative choice. You may think, I'm just sitting in the middle. Please let me have your attention. Please let me see your eyes. There is no middle. There is no middle. There is no middle. You either belong to the kingdom of light or to the kingdom of darkness. There's no middle ground. There's no like, well, I'm still checking it out. Okay, kingdom of darkness. What? That's what this says. It's not, it's not, this isn't the NIV, Neil's interesting version. This is the real NIV, like the new international version or whatever. Like, that's what God's word says. And I would be amiss to send you to hell with a smile on your face. That'd be wrong of me. If I have cancer, I want to know. If I'm sick, I want to know. If I'm dying, tell me. This is the message that had to be given to God's people in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 19. Let me read it to you. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessing and curse. Now I call on heaven and earth as my witness to the choice that you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Verse 20, you can make this choice by loving your God and obeying him and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land of the Lord that he swore to his ancestors, Abraham. Isaac, and Jacob. Choose. And you think you're slippery by being indifferent. All you're doing is making the negative choice. It's the enemy that makes you think that indifference means the middle. There is no middle. There is no middle. There is no middle. You're a part of the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. You don't have to be a part of darkness any longer because light is more powerful than darkness. Listen, Diotrephus, he's the bad. Demetrius, verse 12, let's look at verse 12. He's, he, he's the not so ugly. What do you mean? John writes, everyone speaks highly of Demetrius and so does the truth itself. We ourselves can say the same for him and you know we speak the truth. What does John have to say about, about Demi? Here's what he says. Everyone speaks well of him. So does the truth, the reality. And we even say the same thing. Here's the deal. His dash was awesome. What are you talking about? You have no control over your dates. But you have some element of influence over your dash. I don't know what you're talking about. Let me read this poem to you and see if this makes any sense. This is called The Dash. 
by Linda Ellis. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the two dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that the first date came as the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For the dash represents all the time they spent alive on earth, and now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, and the cash. What matters is how we live in love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. To be less quick to anger and to show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you lived your dash. You have one life to live, and soon it will be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. You have no control over your start and transition date, because you don't ever die, you just transition. Your spirit lives on in one place or the other. But I believe through your attitude actions, beliefs, and choices. You have an element of influence over your dash. I want you to live this day in light of that day. What is going to be said about your dash? Now listen, if you're a command control guy, here's the deal. You may write your own eulogy. I've done a lot of funerals. And there's some people that try and control everything that was said about them while they were still here when they're gone. But here's the deal. When that guy gets up there to speak, you ain't there. Like he can say, this is who this person was. This is their dash. You will have no control over it. Some of you, that freaks you out. Because you're, you're such a manipulator and a hider and you're, you're a presenter and you're a fake. But here's the deal. All things will be revealed. God sees all. Why not just go ahead and live for him? Like, the pretending, you're the one that's being fooled. Not him. Just go ahead and repent and let go of that affair. Let go of that embezzlement. Let go of that lie. Let go of that hatred. Please. Let go of that bitterness and how that person wounded you. Because unforgiveness and bitterness is you drinking the poison and expecting the enemy to die. It doesn't work, man. Forgiveness dispels bitterness and prison. Forgiveness does. It breaks the prison bars. Bitterness does nothing but continue to be cancer to your spirit. And this is what leads us to what I would say is the most heavy part of this message. You go, man, it started with truth and like love. And I thought we were just reading 3 John. Like, here's where it gets gnarly. Verses 13 through 15. This is what John writes. This is the heart of a dad. I have so much more to say to you. But I don't want to write it with pen and ink. For I hope to see you and then we will talk face to face. Peace be with you. Your friends here send their greetings. Please give my personal greetings to each of our friends there. What was John's heart? If you remember this letter, he said he was like writing to his kids. Here's John's heart. I just want to be with my kids. How old was John when he wrote this? He wasn't 12. He wasn't 20. He wasn't in his 30s. He wasn't in his 40s. Some think he was well beyond his 50s. If you've never read The Grandfather Effect by Josh McDowell, you probably should do that. Well, what does that mean? Let me say this respectfully, but let me say it to both husband and wife, 
father and mother. This dynamic where a child wants to be with their parents is normal, natural, and good. Little Leonidas Ulysses Stephen Spencer thinks I'm the coolest person in the world because he's two. He always wants to be with me. Everywhere I go, he, Dad, Dad, take me. Everywhere. That's what Leo wants. That's what Liam wants. That's what Layla wants. That's what Lucy wants. And I think Lily still wants it every once in a while. She's preteen. So here's what I would say. This dynamic of your child wanting to be with you, please listen to this, is both given and earned. Say, what do you mean? They want you when, you're, when, when they're young. And that's normal and natural. But you have a tremendous amount of influence on the staying capacity of this natural desire. Have you ever met a kid that didn't want to connect or be with their parents? That might be called adolescence, so there is like this little caveat here. But let me say this. Have you ever met an adult kid that's, that's grown, that not have a, doesn't have a substance abuse or some kind of crazy thing in their life, but they're like a healthy, contributing member of society? Like they're like, oh, okay, you're like, no, nobody's normal, but you know what I'm saying. Like they're not like, oh, he's got issues, man. But like, no, like, okay, all of us have issues. I hopefully you know what I'm trying to say. But like... You ever met someone? You ever met someone that has a dad and doesn't want to hang out with their dad? You ever met someone that has a, a mom that doesn't want to hang out with their mom or their brother or their sister or whatever? Why is that? Well, you have a daily opportunity to pay the relational investment when they're young. Through time, thought, training. And listen to me, men. Tone. Tone means a lot to a little one. And talent. Hey, you've got a talent. I want to I invest in that. What they want and what they need is you. And I believe this. That's why we're having at least six of them. That the greatest investment in life is children. It has the best potential return on investment. But you know the problem with it? It's real. It's not something you phone in or just kind of do online. It's daily. It's really who you are. Your kids see you. You want to know how someone's really a legit person or how, how legit they are? Ask their adult kids about their personal relationship with their parents. Now again, our, our culture is filled with broken images and expressions and examples of father, mother, brother, sister, child, parent. Nobody. You know, you know, every story is like this. A, B, and somewhere in the middle is the truth, right? Like that's how everything is. So take that with a grain of salt. But to hopefully you hear what I'm saying. We all long for wholeness in our family. For peace. It's not difficult to understand, but it seems to be one of the hardest things in life to, to find a somewhat healthy, functioning family especially in the 21st century. But your kids want to be with you when they're young. And here's an opinion. As you get old and mature and age, you can recognize the parents that paid the relational investment because their kids still want to be around them. M me? My brother, we work here. But that should say something about what we think about our dad and mom. Hey, we respect them. We love our mom and dad. Like, I'm cool with going over to Thanksgiving for my, with my mom and dad's house. I'm not like, oh, gosh, you hear it? No, I'm like, hey, this is cool. Are my mom and dad perfect? Yes, they are. I was paid to say that. No, no, no. <laughs> they're just like you and me. They're just like people, you know, but they're not perfect. But I, if my dad calls, I don't go, oh, my mom calls. I'm not like, blow that off. No, I, yeah, I want to talk to them. That's earned, right? I'm almost 40. 
So I think I'm an adult, even though I never dress like one or talk like one, but I'm halfway dead, man. 39 plus 39 is 78, right? So if you're over 78, God bless you. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> I may not make it to 78. I've got a lot of problems physically. But anyway, like, I may not make it, so I may not even be halfway. I could be two-thirds. Who knows, right? I just know about my dash. I don't know about my dates, and neither do you. Okay. You have no control over your dates, but you do have an element of influence over your dash. I'm just saying this. Please listen, I'm going to wrap this up. Did you know that God sovereignly put you in the family you're in? And you may hate that, but you didn't choose it. Can you believe that? Maybe God has purpose for you being your father's child for you being your mother's daughter, for you being connected to that biological brother or sister or auntie or uncle or grandma or grandpa. And God wants to use that relationship to see you grow. Did you know that God cares more about your character than your comfort? Don't you hate that? As Americans, we want comfort. But God cares about your character. So maybe he said, oh, you're going to be in that family. But that guy was messed up. So are you. Maybe hurt people hurt people, you know? Until you know someone's story and dream, you don't really know them. This is all I'm saying. Listen, the holidays are here. Why don't we leverage that? What do you mean? Life is too short to have disconnect in family. As much as depends upon you, please be at peace with everyone. That's not the NIV. That's Romans 12. Verses 18 and 19. NIV, Neil's interesting. It, it is the NIV. Neil, I got to come up with another phrase, international version. I'm just saying this. Let's get healthy in our relationships. How can you read Romans 12 and not walk away with that and go, man, I've got some areas to grow? I, every time I read, I'm like, wow, I need Jesus. Every day, I need Jesus. Like, I've got so many things that I've still got to grow in. In 2nd and 3rd John, we're learning about the pillars of faith and practice known as truth, love, and obedience. In 3rd John, we're given three examples, the good, the bad, and the not-so-ugly. Gaius, Diotrephus, and Demetrius. And this morning, here's my heart. I want you to do well as a human being. I think you need to grow spiritually, organically, and strategically in your walk in obedience with God. And I think you have a next step. You may say, well, what's my next step? I, I tried to write it down to the best of my ability. This isn't perfect. I'm still working on it. I've been working on it since the age of 19. Reading, observing, and watching until it was time to write it down. And I just think that God loves you. <laughs> and, and I just think that you're not an accident. And I just think that God has good plans for you. And I think that as you partner with him by his spirit, he wants to change you and produce fruit in your life. And I just think that what John wrote here in 3 John are meant to be story and example of a dash. You don't want Diotrephus' dash. And I don't want you to live in regret. Yesterday is gone. Today's a brand new day. You're not dead. Your, your, your end date, transition date is not here. Your dash is here. What you do today with this message in your attitude, actions, beliefs, and choices will still potentially influence your dash. Keep your head up. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. God can restore the years that the locusts have eaten. God's amazing. You know how I know that? Because I know a kid who from age 1 to age 18 used to sit right over there and not be too interested in this stuff. And at 19, things change. I'm that kid. If I can change, you can change. If there's hope for me, I'm a terrible person. There's way, probably way more hope for you. I know me. I know me. I am a sinner through and through. I need a Savior. I didn't just need a Savior. I, I need a Savior. I need someone to cover me. Because I don't have it all together. And I never will. But I can't wait for that day when I'll finally see the face of the voice that I've followed since the age of 19. I hope it's soon.
Because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. And if you'll believe in him, you'll have everlasting life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn you. That through him you might be saved. And here's the thing. Light has come into the world. But darkness hates the light. It hides from it. But if you're of God, you're not of the world. You're not of darkness. You're of light. So this morning, if you're a believer, get closer to the light. Get in his word. Be with God's people. Live your life with purpose to see other people be in love with God and be connected. And then you're finally beginning to grow spiritually, organically, and strategically in status, salary, sex, substance, situation, and stuff are no longer your functional savior. Jesus.